At the beginning of last unit, we took a look at different kinds of substances, ionic, network, metallic, and molecular. What we're going to do now is explain some other properties of substances like this based on what are called attractive forces. Intermolecular attractive forces are the attractive forces that hold molecules together. That's why they're called intermolecular attractive forces. They're kind of analogous to the magnetic forces that hold magnets together. The stronger the attractive force, the harder it is yeah, to break the particles apart from each other. Therefore, it'll take more energy to melt it and boil it. And it'll also take more energy to melt each gram and boil each gram. You might remember we said network solids are made up of nonmetal atoms that are covalently bonded together in a great big network. There's no weak spots. The type of substance was covalent because it was held together by covalent bonds, network, solid. And because there are no weak spots, the intermolecular attractive force strength is insanely high. It's insane! Therefore, the melting point, boiling point, and heat of phase change is also going to be insanely high. Crazy. If it's ionic, there's a full positive and full negative attracting. Therefore, being ionic, it has a fairly high attractive force strength. Full positive, full negative. Melting point, boiling point, and heat of phase change will be pretty high. Now we also talked in the last unit about polar molecules versus nonpolar molecules. Polar molecules have partially charged ends, where the partially charged positive side of one molecule and the partially charged negative side of the other molecule will attract each other. Now obviously if the charges are partial, they're not going to be as strong as if the charges had been full. Therefore, polar molecules attract each other a lot more weakly than ionic substances do. Hydrogen bond attractive forces and dipole attractive forces come from polar molecules. In other words, molecules with only one line of symmetry in them. Hydrogen bond is an especially strong type of attractive force that happens when you have a hydrogen atom as the partially positive end of one molecule and a highly electronegative atom like nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine as the partially negative end of the other molecule. This will be very strongly attracted because of the high electronegativity difference. It's not quite high enough to be ionic, but it's a lot higher than most molecules. So if you've got a polar molecule, if there's hydrogen on one end of a molecule attracted to NO or F on another molecule, it's called a hydrogen bond attraction. If there is no hydrogen on one side and NO or F on the other side, then it's called a straight dipole attraction. For example, if we had H on one end and let's say sulfur on the other end, this hydrogen is partially positive and this sulfur is partially negative, but because the electronegativity difference isn't very high, the attractive force strength will be weaker than with hydrogen bond. London dispersion forces are extremely weak attractive forces caused by attractions between nonpolar molecules. Remember, nonpolar molecules had two lines of symmetry. Their electrons were evenly distributed throughout the whole molecule. So there were no positive or negative ends to the molecule that could really cause an attraction. Therefore, hydrogen bonds have moderate attractive force strength. Dipole have moderate to weak attractive force strength. And London dispersion is weak. Most things that have London dispersion forces as their attractive forces tend to be gases at room temperature, like the oxygen and nitrogen in the air. Oxygen has two lines of symmetry. Therefore, the molecule is nonpolar. London dispersion forces, because where are the charged ends? There aren't any. So if there are no charged ends, how are they going to attract? Nitrogen, which also makes up part of air, 
also has two lines of symmetry. Again, same thing. There's no partially charged ends. So why would they attract at all? I mean, if you cool down oxygen enough, and you've got to cool it down wicked far, you can actually get it to condense into a liquid. But if there are no attractive forces, how could it condense into a liquid? There are attractive forces. They're just really weak. And here's how it happens. Here's an electron being shared by the two oxygens. One for you, one for me, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. Totally even. Oh my goodness, how boring. But freeze frame. At this instant in time, that electron is on that side of the molecule, making this side of the molecule partially negative. But just for an instant, boom! And this end partially positive. But again, just for an instant. Because in the next instant, that electron moves over to the other side. In that instant, this side is partially negative, and this side is partially positive. Now, if the molecules happen to be oriented correctly, they can be attracted to each other momentarily, instantaneously. That's why it's so weak. There are temporary poles, not permanent poles. And that's why nonpolar molecules, A, have attractive forces at all, and B, have such incredibly weak attractive forces. So hydrogen bonds have moderate melting and boiling points and heat of phase change. Water actually has a very high melting point for a molecule its size. Most molecules' water size are gases. It's only water's hydrogen bonds that allow it to be a liquid, and also give it surface tension that allows insects to walk across its surface, or hurt so badly when you do a belly flop into a swimming pool. Dipole attractions have fairly low melting and boiling points and heats of phase change. What about London dispersion? Very low. Most things with London dispersion, unless they're really big molecules that can get all tangled up in each other, tend to be gases at room temperature. Let's see if we can tell what kind of attractive forces a molecule is going to have. First, let's take a molecule of hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide has one line of symmetry, which makes it a polar molecule. It has H on one side, but it doesn't have N, O, or F on the other. Therefore, the attractive force type is dipole, because the sulfur with greater electronegativity and the hydrogen with less, this will act as a magnet when coming near other hydrogen sulfide molecules. Now we have water, which also has one line of symmetry, with oxygen being the more electronegative atom. We have oxygen on one end and hydrogen on the other. Now remember, if it's polar with one line of symmetry and it has H on one end and N, O, or F on the other, it's that special kind of attractive force called a hydrogen bond attractive force. Hydrogen bonds are very strong, which is why water has such a high melting and boiling point for its size. Hydrogen sulfide is a bigger molecule because sulfur is a bigger atom. Yet hydrogen sulfide is a gas at room temperature because it doesn't have the strong hydrogen bond attractions that water does. Methane, CH4, has one, two, three, four lines of symmetry. This makes the molecule nonpolar. There are no permanent poles on this molecule. Therefore, London dispersion is the name of the attractive force. Extremely weak, which is why methane is a gas. Now, if we made the molecule bigger, this is called ethane. This has two lines of symmetry, which makes it nonpolar, which means it's also London dispersion. But because it's a bigger molecule than methane, it will have stronger London dispersion forces. In fact, the bigger the molecule gets, the stronger the London dispersion forces will be. Bigger nonpolar molecules will have stronger London dispersion forces. HCl has one line of symmetry, which makes it polar. It has H on one side, but it doesn't have NO or F on the other. Therefore, it's dipole attraction. Hydrogen fluoride is also polar, but because you have H on one side and NO or F on the other, this is hydrogen bond. And that's how you can tell what type of attractive force is being formed between molecules.